Okay. Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? I was getting uh, the look over there from Braden back there, and he's giving me a thumbs up. It's time to go. So um, it's not very pleasant outside right now. This is like Michigan spring. So, but I feel like in all fairness, this winter has not been all that bad, has it? We've had a lot of sun, and I've, I'm one of those people that get that seasonal depression every year, uh, like right around this time, where you just, you just need some vitamin D. And I don't feel like I've gotten it this year. It's been great. We've had a lot of sunny days, so we can handle this. This is because uh, in two months, we're going to be like, this is why we live in Michigan. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Michael. Um, I'm the youth director here at the, at the church. I have all of our teenagers, our 6th through 12th graders. So you're probably going to get a lot of like teenage uh, innuendos in this where I kind of connect through because I'm, I'm just always with them. I was with them at the middle school this morning for a career fair uh, which was a really big blessing. Uh, we had an opportunity where the middle school asked us to, Linda Middle School asked us to come in and talk about what a pastor looks like. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. It, it hasn't happened since before COVID, and um, we were able to share the gospel in there. So you have about 200 kids, seventh and eighth grade, uh, that have clearly heard the gospel this morning um, in all these classes. So it's that is huge. Yeah, praise the Lord. Um, which... We've been in the schools. We're at Linden Elementary. We're at Linden Central um, Elementary. There is a study going on at Linden Middle School with, uh, with kids there. And then at Fenton, uh, Fenton High School, there's a study. And then Cheryl Stockwell in Brighton. So within like the school system, God is working through the, through the youth right now. And it's really, it's really an awesome um, to see that because it's not an easy place to break through. Uh, people definitely don't want us in the schools right now. So... Um, so originally, I was supposed to teach a few weeks ago, and Kurt was awesome. He, he stepped in and taught for me because I had to speak over the weekend. Uh, but originally, I was going to uh, talk about uh, my trip to Israel because I went to Israel. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, but I'm also going to tie it in with Matthew 13. So uh, we're going to start out in Matthew 13. We're entering into uh, a new chapter here and kind of a new section of... Um, Jesus is going to do something new in this, in this chapter. But I just want to pray for us before we open God's word and, and pray that we're blessed today uh, through it. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this morning. Um, Lord, we thank you for everybody that you drew in the door, um, that we get to be able to uh, just freely open your word, Lord, and allow it to uh, transform us and shape us to be more like your son, Jesus. God, I pray that as we do open your word, that uh, we would learn from it and we would be blessed. God, I pray for anybody in this room that may be struggling or that is uh, dealing with a sickness. I know uh, Lisa, Kurt's wife, is currently not feeling well. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, give her body healing, get her, um, allow her to be recover quickly, be with Kurt during this time as he cares for her. Uh, she gets back on her feet. But that also gets extended to anybody else that might be dealing with uh, an illness or just anything, um, any kind of trial or anything that's going on in their life. Lord, I just pray that you would just encourage them. And God, we just, again, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's, uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I wanna read through Matthew uh, verses uh, one, uh, verse, chapter 13, verses one through 17, and then uh, we'll start to kind of unpack it as we, as we work, work through this. So Matthew 13, I'm reading out of the ESV right now. It says, uh, that same day, Jesus went out of the house and he sat beside the sea, and great crowds they gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and he sat down. And the whole crowd, they stood on a beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed some seeds, they fell along the path, and the birds came and they devoured them. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, and they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose and they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds, they fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and they choked them out. Other seeds, they fell on the good soil and produced good grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. Verse 10 it says, then the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it has not been given. For, the one, for to the one who has, more will be given. 
and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Verse 13, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and with their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people have longed to see what you see, and they did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So what's happening in this section here, uh, chapter 13, we looked at last week how you have the Pharisees. There is an open denial of, God, uh, of Jesus as God, and we saw, uh, we saw Adam teach that through the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. And what's happening here is Jesus is now going to change direction into teaching into what's called parables. He's going to start teaching to people in a different form uh, to illustrate a truth, um, like use an a earthly story to basically illustrate um, uh, a heavenly meaning. And so where I wanted to kind of tie this in with Israel is because I've went i been there twice now, and I went about five years ago, and it was a huge culture shock to, my, to me and my wife. I didn't know what to expect. Um, I am one of those people that I'm a, I'm a visual learner. I like to tangibly grab onto things. I've always been that way, which means I struggled through school. Um, so... Uh, going there, it was great to see like archaeological sites and, um, and just to be able to tangibly be somewhere where these things happen. So I have like a touch and smell and that kind of thing attached to as I'm reading through the Bible. But one of the things that I wasn't really prepared for when I went there was the culture, um, was seeing the people and seeing um, just the melting pot of like, the, the Jewish people. You have the Muslim people. You have the different sects of Jewish people. You have um, Christianity, which is, well... That is a broad statement. And that's all there in that country. So this last time when we went, um, we went to a lot of locations because um, we went with my brother and my sister. And one of the locations that we, they wanted to go to Bethlehem to see where Jesus was born. And if you've ever been to Israel, one of the things they do in that nation is they build a huge church or like a huge monument over every site that they claim something happened. And, and honestly, they really probably a lot of these locations, they don't know if it really happened, if Jesus broke bread on that rock specifically or uh, if he was specifically born in that location. But there's a lot of sites that where they claim that these things have happened. And one of the things that I notice when you go to these places, there's a lot of like idol worship. People go to these sites in hopes that they're going to, well, glean some sort of power out of this. Like they're, they're trying to um, achieve like some sort of experience. Like they're, they're going to they, they need to see something specific, like thinking that they're going to like achieve God's power by looking at all this. And honestly, it, it slapped me in the face. It was very, it was a big turnoff because I, I sat there and I'm like, I, this isn't why I personally came there. None of this really means anything. And so uh, the first time we went to the, the place in Bethlehem, there was like a fight that broke out with people trying to get down there. And these are all Christians that are going crazy, trying to get down into the spot. And people were fighting, kind of stampeding each other. And I stood up there and I, and I preached to them, you know, and the guy that was guiding us around, he's like, you can't do that. What are you doing? And I'm like, well, these are supposedly brothers and sisters in Christ. So um, I rebuked it, I rebuked them. And I mean, it just made things a little more hostile. So the second time we ended up going there, <laughs> they wanted to attack me. And my wife's like, what are you doing? Like, we need to come home. We need to get home in one piece. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And so... Um, you just, it just, it, things became hostile. And I noticed that at every location we went to, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where they believed Jesus was crucified, like all of these places. And, and so the second time we went, I didn't really want to go to these places. Um, I, my wife and I were kind of like turned off by it, but my brother and my sister, they really wanted to uh, see these locations. And we went to Bethlehem, we went to the same church, and there was a guy that ended up, because uh, we didn't really go with the tour, we we just, uh, we hired a taxi driver to drive us around and we kind of went rogue around the country. And we did that the first time, we did it the second time. And um, 
It worked out really well. But when we went there, this, uh, he gave us a tour guide, and this guy's name was Jabir. And Jabir is a, a Palestinian because in Bethlehem, it's in the West Bank, so it's kind of like walled off. Israel, uh, Israelites can't... Um, Israelites can go back and forth, but the Palestinians, they can't come into Israel. They have to stay in the West Bank. And so this guy was uh, a Palestinian that lived in Bethlehem, but he was a Christian. And he has been there his whole, uh, he was there before they drew the borders when Israel became a nation in 1948. And um, I had an opportunity to start speaking with this guy. And I mean, there's a lot of people over there that would claim to be a Christian. Um, I don't. I don't know their heart, but I mean, we're going to learn today that we can see that believers bear fruit, true believers in Jesus Christ bear fruit. This man was filled with the Holy Spirit. This was a man that loved Jesus, and he was devoted um, to his mission. So he was sharing with me just a lot of the difficulties that he experienced there, how it's hard. He's sectioned in there. Um, He is um, basically... He said in his town, there's probably a handful of Christians, even though this is the place where uh, Jesus was born. Um, They're mostly Muslim. And so the guy that was driving the taxi, he was Muslim. Our taxi driver was Muslim. And so we go there, and we're getting ready to walk down the stairs, and this guy's standing there, and everybody's kind of doing the same thing, and I'm standing there with my wife, and we're looking at each other, here we go again. And... um, And then he stands there, and he's he asks everybody, he's like, you know, I have a question for you. He's like, is this enough? Like, is it enough that you need to see this? Like, why did you come here? Like, what is the purpose of you? Why are you here? He's like, I grew up here. He goes, and I'm a follower of Jesus. And he's like, and I have the honor of being in the place where something like this happened. He goes, but wherever you're from, he's like, this means nothing if Jesus isn't in your heart. And he's like, so I would ask you, why are you here? He's like, Do you really need to walk down in here? And so he started to share the gospel. Like, I mean, he he clearly laid the gospel out. You know, I'm standing there like, oh oh my gosh. Like, (laughs) Lord, like, I mean, very convicted because you're you're watching this because I just automatically summed up everybody in the same basket. But while he was sharing the gospel, the people that were there, they could have cared less. Like, it was, they were just there to see, hoping to glean something, um, glean some power. They walk down in there. They have handkerchiefs. They have crosses. And they're rubbing them in the cracks. And, you know, they're going to take them home with them. And it's like some relic that they're going to take. And, and so I'm, I, was just, I was just awestruck over it. And this man, he clearly laid out the gospel. And so I think, like, think about God's word going forth. Jesus over there. This is where the gospel, like, exploded across the planet. It started right here with Jesus. And Jesus came here and he spoke truth. And he, sp- and he was clear about it. And people rejected it. Like they were, came to look. They wanted to see his miracles. They were hoping they were going to glean something special from it. But they clearly rejected who he was. And so being there, you still see that evident today. Like this is, this is happening. And so it makes me think about like our mission. I talk about that a lot because I'm very evangelical. I love to share truth with people out in the world. And so it's natural that when I go there, I'm going to recognize all of these things. Um, There's another instance where we were in Nazareth, and this is when uh, in Luke 4, where Jesus goes into his hometown and he opens up the scroll of Isaiah, and he and and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah and says, "Today this has been fulfilled." Um, and they become very angry. He rebukes them, and they take him outside of the city to stone him and throw him off a cliff. But he escapes. Um, so we're in there, and I'm, and I'm talking, and I'm reading through Scripture in this church, and there was a guy that was watching over the church. I don't remember what his name is, to be honest, but um, another man, similar to Jabir that I met, um, lives on the Israeli side and grew up there. And I had an opportunity to speak with him, and he pulled aside. He's like, what do you want to know? And he's like, you seem genuine. And I'm like, what does that mean? He goes, I see a lot of people that come through here. He goes, and you seem more genuine than the others. He's like, so I'd like to have a real conversation with you about God's word. And I was, well, I'm like, okay. So anyways, we ended up having a Bible study there for an hour right outside of this church, or well, where they claim that the, the synagogue was that Jesus was in, um, the remains of it. And um, I asked him, I'm like, what is it like being a Christian here? And he says, it's very difficult. 
He's like, it's, it's, it's hard. He goes, because what you see, he goes, is you still see the hardness of heart um, from not only the Jews, but he's like, you see it also from the Christian side as well. Like people coming here claiming to be followers. He goes, I watched the word um, get proclaimed. He goes, and it just seems to fall on, on deaf ears. He goes, and that's why I wanted to have a conversation with you. He's like, because you were reading the word. He goes, and you looked like a man. You looked like a person um, that had just the fruit of what a follower of Jesus Christ looked like. Um, so anyhow, I got to meet a lot of these, I got to meet a couple of these people and that was a big thing. Um, that was huge while I was over there. And so it made me think about the parable that we're diving into tonight, uh, the first parable. And that is the reason why Jesus ended up speaking to these people in parables in the first place is because uh, a parable was something that was um, an earthly, it was an earthly story it was like an analogy, essentially, and he set it aside a truth, and he did that to reveal truth to those who had ears to hear, and then he did that to conceal truth against those who had, a, had hardened their hearts against this message. And so now he speaks to these crowds in, like, big crowds in nothing but parables. And so it's almost like he's establishing, like, a filter um, as his word is going to go out. And this filter is going to the people that actually belong to him, the seed that falls on a good soil, which we're going to see, um, are those who receive his word, and they're going to hear it. And as this lure gets casted out, it's like a lure. I kind of look at it like a lure getting casted out next to a fish. The fish is going to grab onto the lure. Those of us that have a relationship with Christ, we're going to look at these stories, and we're going to want to dig in deeper and dig into his word, and we're going to want to learn more, and we're going to want to glean uh, how can this be applied to my own life? How can I... Uh, how can I be transformed through this? Where somebody that is um, clearly hardening their heart against it is going to, is just going to, they're just going to look past it. And that's, that's essentially what he's going to do with these parables as he speaks, them, speaks with them. And so the parable of the sower, um, I want to go over to verse, uh, let's go to verse, well, I guess we'll just start in verse 1. Um, so that same day, Jesus went out of the house and he sat beside the sea and great crowd, crowds had gathered about him so that they got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd, uh, they stood on the beach. So the cool thing with, with this right here is a lot of us, we think like he spoke to a, a huge mass of people. So over there, like when you're in Israel, you wonder like, was his voice magnified? Or like, how was it? Was it like miraculous? And uh, the way it was portrayed, like, he went out into a boat and sat on it because it actually acted like an amphitheater. Your voice projected, like you could hear it all the way around. So when you go there, your voice will carry. Um, there's the Valley of Allah where they claim that David and Goliath fought and the Israelites would have been on one hill and then the, um, the um, Philistines would have been on the other hill. Well, you can go down at the very bottom of the valley, at the bottom of the one hill and go up, and we can have a conversation, and you can hear it as clear as day, and we're talking probably from here all the way to the expressway. And so the way the acoustics worked, it's just, it's kind of crazy. So as Jesus was speaking, I wanted to share that with you because that was something that I also noticed. As he's speaking to the crowds, his voice would have been projected, and they probably would have been still listening, um, not like a lot of the teenagers that I speak to. <laughs> this a, or, or, or more older, or seasoned in age. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. So it says that he, uh, he told them many things in parables, saying, uh, and then in this parable, he's going to give us this illustration. Uh, he's going to give us a story. And a lot of the parables that he uses, he uses um, things that were common to them. And I guess if he came today, he would probably use things like technology or things like that. But he didn't choose this time to come. He chose this time. So they become timeless to where it doesn't matter what era we're in, we can still clearly see those that follow Christ. We can still clearly see his truth that he's trying to illustrate. Uh, it says, a, um, a sower went out, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came along, and they devoured them. So what he's giving, he's giving like an ag agricultural like uh, picture here. Uh, back in Israel, when they used to farm, like everything is rock there. The place is like desert. Like it's, uh, it's I, don't, I would not want to be a farmer there. Um, I did landscaping for a lot of years. I would not want to dig in this ground. There's rock everywhere. So it requires a lot of work to move things out of the way. Um, but the way they would farm is they, would, they don't farm like they did, like we do now in these, in these rows and they plant these seed. They would 
uh, walk across the field and they would just toss seed around. And so you had these footpaths where people would walk and the seed would fall on this footpath. And so it's a packed down hard ground. And, um, and what he's saying here is the fact that when the seed would fall on the ground, it wouldn't um, settle in. The birds would come behind the sower and they would just pluck the seed and, and they would eat it. Um, and it says, and then he sowed, um, verse 5, it says, other seeds fell on the rocky ground where they didn't have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. So like I said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of rock there. Like maybe there's a, a top layer of some soil, but underneath there, it's like all bedrock. So you would have had a thin layer. If you've ever seen like, sometimes you'll see like weeds grow, like oh, you can grow sod on top of concrete if you water it enough. But, um, but when the sun comes out and as soon as the water goes away, the thing will bake and it'll just die. Um, and so... And then it goes on in verse six and it says, but when the sun rose, they were scorched and they had no root and they withered away. It says other seeds, they fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and they choked them. Other seeds, they fell on, uh, so the thorns would be like, if you've, ever, if you've ever gardened or anything like that, I don't know, the weeds just grow, right? They always grow. It doesn't matter what kind of soil they're in, they just seem to, they'll take over. Um, and so uh, the weeds choked out this, um, the seeds that fell among the soil with, uh, with all of the, the thorns. And it says, other seeds, they fell, other seeds, they fell among good soil, and this produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. It says, he who has ears, let them hear. So he gives us this picture story of this agriculture picture story of what he's trying to illustrate. And then he comes down, and what's awesome with this is the disciples ask him for an interpretation of what does this mean and why are you speaking in parables? And he tells them, I'm speaking in parables because I'm going to, I'm going to speak a, a story and I'm going to speak a truth to those who have ears to hear. And so that way they can glean a, a, hard under, a stronger understanding of what I'm saying. But those who have hardened their hearts against it, it's just going to, it, they're not going to understand what it is at all. But he gives the disciples the, the interpretation of this parable. And so we're going to go down into verse 18. Okay, verse 18, it says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away uh, what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So what we're about to find out here is what this parable is illustrating is as God's word went out, um, it, when it falls, when it is, it's the seed and his word is casted along the world and on the hearts of people all over the world, people are going to respond into it in four different ways. And so the seed represents God's word. And the sower represents, well, in this case, Jesus. But he has given us that commission to then go forward. And he's entrusted us with the seed bag to go cast his seed forward. And so as the seed is then tossed around, as it falls on the hard ground, this would be the person um, that has a complete hardened heart against this, his word as it's proclaimed. Um, like a, a perfect example, it would be somebody like Pharaoh, right? Well, we read in the Old Testament in Exodus, uh, Pharaoh was a man that just continually hardened his heart against, uh, um, against the knowledge of the Lord and who he was, and then um, the enemy just snatched it away. Um, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 3 through 4, if you guys want to turn there. Second uh, Corinthians chapter four verses three through four. We're going to be in. So we know the enemy to be real, and he doesn't want us to have a relationship with God. He's going to do everything that he can in his power to keep us from hearing the word of God or from having a relationship with God. Um, we were created in the image of God, and he does, and he is, he has been under, he has attacked, he attacks that. And so, 
Um, in this verse here, it says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world, which would be Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So as the seed is thrown, I've watched this happen to a lot of people. I was one of these people before before I came to know the Lord, I had a lot of people that shared truth with me in my life, um, like really shared the gospel with me. And I clearly rebelled against it and denied it. And not just like shrugged it off, but I don't want any part of this. Like, please stop sharing truth with me. I don't, what are you doing? Well, I don't even call it truth. Like it wasn't truth to me. It was just nonsense. And so I would I responded in a rude fashion. And so this would be the person that has a hard heart against it. Um, but one thing that we need to keep in mind is we don't know at what point God could open that person's heart because at, some, at one point he opened my heart and he brought me to a place and, and, and I came to know who Christ was and he changed me into new creation. And so it's important that we continue to sow the seed. In Jeremiah twenty three twenty nine it says, um, you can, you know, I can read it for you guys. You don't have to turn back there. It says, is not my word like a fire declares the Lord and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. So as God's word goes out, even though there's a hardened heart, it still can shatter that hardened heart and penetrate. And we can take, com take comfort in the fact that it's God that is the one that is going to, um, that's actually going to do the increase. So uh, the hard soil represents the one that just has a hardened heart against it. Um, I guess we could use Nicodemus as an example of maybe something like this. I mean, maybe we're making an assumption, but Nicodemus was somebody that in John in John 3, that God had a Jesus had a conversation with, and he somewhat gives them a parable. Um, I guess we wouldn't call it a parable, but an illustration talking about how you're, um, um, how you're born, right, um, to be born again. And Nicodemus asks what all of this means, and then we see Nicodemus later on in the scripture. He's there at the bury, uh, um, preparing the burial of Jesus um, at his resurrection. So perhaps there is... Um, somebody that softened, heart was softened to, uh, to hear the truth. So uh, the next one is in verse 20. We are talking about the rocky soil now. So we're back over in Matthew. It says, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but he endures for a little while and when tribulation or persecution arises on the account of the word, immediately he falls away. So this is kind of like, like the Alka-Seltzer Christian. Like, and I wouldn't even call him a Christian because I'm going to get to something bold at the end of all of this. Um, this is somebody that would respond to the gospel, um, to an experience. Maybe they experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Um, and they have an excitement of the word for a moment, but then they fizzle out. I watch this happen all the time with the teenagers at camp. We take them to a camp. They have an experience. You know, they feel the conviction. Um, they say they're going to follow this. They want to do it. But then within like two weeks, they're right back in the world. And this would be somebody that I would say that widespread across the church, this, is, this encompasses a lot of people that would say that they're claimed to be followers of Christ. And they pop in the door maybe once a year, and I know I'm saying something bold here, but this is the reality, and he is giving us a parable where he is showing us how people respond to his word being casted forth. And this is somebody that, well, they're like the Elker Seltzer. They pop for a minute, but then when trials and tribulations come um, on the account of the word, on the account of Jesus Christ, what the cost would be of being a follower of him, because we know as followers, uh, the cost is high. And it's not easy to be a follower of Jesus. And so anybody that would say that it is, it's, I mean, yes, he's the one that rescues us out of everything, but it's hard. And when that comes, they just fizzle away. And so I have, there are a lot of people that I have experienced and I still know to this moment that this is where they're at. And I pray for them, um, but they're just there for a second and then they, and then they, they wither away. Uh, the next one is the thorny soil, verse 22. 
it says, as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves to be unfruitful. This is a person that is just totally encompassed with the world, like everything that it has to offer, all the distractions, searching for the best career, searching for the best toys to have, the best vacation I can go on, like the most amount of money, like fitting in with other people, how people perceive me, like totally like just into all the distractions. And so they respond to the truth, but they're not willing to submit to the truth and submit to following Jesus. They are completely distracted with what's going on in the world, the lure of this world. Um, in First John uh, 2, you guys can turn over there. I've really been on a First John kick lately um, just because it's just it's so good. Uh, verse 15, First John 2, verse 15. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And this world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. I mean how many people are completely encompassed in everything else that, has to, that, that is opposite from God? This one is sobering as well. Um, people are more concerned with what they can have in the world than what, um, than what a true relationship looks like with the Father, with Jesus. And so this brings us to the next one, the good soil. And so... I want to make a, I'm going to make a bold claim on all of these because I know that this parable is taught from, some people teach this parable that these are, um, the four soils represent four different kinds of believers. And um, what we can see from this parable is um, they're not. There's only one soil that is a true follower of Jesus Christ because there's only one soil that produces fruit. Some a little, some, some a little more, and some a lot. So in verse, um, in verse, 23, it says, for as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and he yields. In one case, a hundredfold, and in another case, 60, and in another case, 30. So in, for, in John 15, 8, you don't have to go there. It says, by this, my father is glorified that you, much, that you may bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. True followers of Jesus Christ are going to have fruit evident in their life. Um, fruit of the spirit is God's character working through the follower of Christ. Like that is evident in somebody. And so as you see somebody that claims to be a follower of Christ, they should have this fruit evident in their life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I'm not talking like what the world would consider that. I'm talking like God's actual character, like true, like his love, his peace. Uh, no matter what kind of trial or tribulation you're going through, there's a, there's a joy and a peace about you. Like a follower is going to have some of that evident in their life. Maybe some of it not like as abundant as another follower, but in this case with the soil, what we're seeing is at least there's some and so I think that is beautiful because that shows what our walk with the Lord looks like as we, as we follow him because as we grow, we, we grow and we become more conformed to his image. Um, we're, we're sanctified. We be, um, as we're washed with the word and he, he starts to mold us and shape us to become more like him. Um, and so our life ends up bearing more fruit, especially as we abide and walk in step with his Holy Spirit. Um, in Matthew seven fifteen. This kind of takes us back to the Sermon on the Mount. It 
It says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will rec- recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tr- tree will bear bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. So a follower of Jesus is going to have fruit evident in their life. And so these other three soils, they don't represent what a true follower looks like. And so um, what does this do for us, those of us that belong to him? Like what is... What is my big takeaway from this parable and, and from even going to Israel in the first place? And I think it's the urgency to, to cast his seed across the world. Like we have been entrusted with it. We've been entrusted with God's word, with the message that Jesus Christ came to rescue us from our sin. And we can have a relationship with God by placing our trust in him. He has trusted us with this message to take this forward. And so we're supposed to go scatter the seed. I think about... Like in Capernaum, right? We're talking about Matthew. Like while being in that town, it's probably one of my favorite places while being there, like on the Sea of Galilee. Um, This is a place where like Matthew was a tax collector. This is a guy that was, I mean, he was shrewd. Nobody wanted to, nobody, everybody hated him. And yet his tax booth was sitting right next to the synagogue where it's like, they say that the tax booths were literally right next to the synagogue. And like they know where the synagogue is in Capernaum and like, cause they actually, that's one of the cool ways to be able to identify locations over there is, you know, where wells were and you know where synagogues were. A lot of other things, it's hard to identify their, their real location. Um, but that would have been a place where Jesus would have taught. And so here's his tax booth sitting right outside the synagogue and he would have heard the word being sent forth in the synagogue while he's sitting in this booth and it penetrated It penetrated a heart that was softened. And God called him and he said, come follow me. And Matthew, he walked out of that tax booth and he left everything and he followed God. And here we are reading out of his gospel, his account of Jesus. And so God's word is powerful. I mean, and we can take comfort in the fact that we're not the one that are, we're not responsible for increasing the growth in somebody. We've just, we got, a, we got a bag of seed attached to our hip, his word, and we're supposed to be walking down the rows and we're supposed to be just tossing it out because we don't know at what point it's going to fall upon a good soil and it's going to germinate and turn into a, a true follower of Christ and what that person is going to do and how God is going to use them. Somebody like Matthew, it fell in good soil and look what he did. And so I think that that gives us encouragement. Doesn't it give you guys encouragement? Yeah. So it says in Matthew, um, in Acts, uh, or no, 1 Corinthians 9.16. It's one of, my, one of my favorite verses. This is Paul speaking. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.16. It says, For if I preach the gospel that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity, it is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And so I think about this Jabir over there nestled in a place where everybody hates this guy. I mean, surrounded around Muslim. 2% of the nation of Israel is actually considered Christian. And so this guy, that, which, isn't that crazy statistics? I mean, all the people that go there and flock there and they tour, they, they're there to go see the Holy Land, but the actual people that live in Israel, 2%. So where the gospel came forward, only 2% would claim to be Christian in that nation. And here is a man that is in Palestinian territory um, that's locked up there, essentially, as a fellow believer in Christ that is sold out for the mission, 
to not only with the Muslims, but also with the Christians that come there that claim to be followers of Christ, still claim we bolding. He can recognize the fact that these people that are coming there trying to glean some sort of power out of these places, like he's there boldly proclaiming the gospel. And then the other guy that was over in Nazareth, same thing, boldly proclaiming truth. And so that to me, that gives me encouragement and I think it should give us encouragement as well. Uh, because one thing with the nation of Israel is it is a melting pot and as you watch the Jews, it's no different. The Bible comes to life. St they still have a hardened heart against this message. They never recognized their Messiah when he came. That's why Jesus wept over Jerusalem. There was a nation that he... He, he, he showed to fo follow me. Let me show you what my character is and who I am. And let me give you this law to point to the fact that you need me. And so when I came, they missed the mark. They didn't recognize it. And they're still there to this day. Same thing. It's like the Bible comes to life. And, and so they have a hard heart against it. They're, they're, they're banging their heads against the wall over there where they think God's power dwells because they don't have their third temple. They can't continue their sacrificing. Um, they don't want any part of this message. And I think the even, which is sad, which is, it's really sad. And so it's sobering. And even more sad are all of the, the followers of Christ that claim to be followers, uh, just watching the behavior of them while they're there. So um, I wanted to open it up for any questions that you guys might have um, on the trip. They don't want to accept Jesus. That's the whole problem right there because it's it's put in their heads that he was a, like a antichrist. I mean, he was a pretender or a great musician, uh, uh, musician, uh, magician. Sorry. Yeah. Because uh, I had a Jew one time that I worked with, and he told me that's exactly what he told me because I asked him about Jesus Christ, and he goes, "No, you know, he was just a great magician." And I said, oh, I don't, I don't even want to work in this same building with you. <laughs> I was 19 years old, and I went out the door and walked up down the street. <laughs> but you know, he was killed about two months later, shot five times by robbers. And uh, I went down to visit him, and he even kicked the, the end of the bed off. And I've thought of that so many times because he was such a nice guy. But he said he, he did not believe in Jesus. Said he was a great man and just a great musician. That's all he said. Yeah, it's sad. So, so they, they really, really, it's just embedded in them, most of them, unless they have accepted or, or and they seen him do all, back then, they seen him do all of those great things. And it just didn't move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they thought he was coming to set up, uh, to rescue them from Roman oppression, set up his kingdom right there. They wanted the earthly kingdom. And so when he came, the triumphal entry, they all like celebrated him as the Messiah coming in. But then when they realized that that's not what he came for, he came to deal with sin, the very thing that he was trying to point them to in the first place, um, they rejected him. And so, uh, and they're still rejecting him. And people are really no different even than them. Like you, you talk about works base, like the whole, everybody tries to earn, think that there's somehow they can earn God's, earn God's favor or that there, there's some way that they can earn their way to salvation. And, and it's not, that's not true at all. Like we approach God bankrupt. We come to him humble and we say, Lord, um, you created me. You created all of this. Uh, you created me to have a relationship with you, but I am a sinner. Um, and it is my sin that makes a separation between me and you. And, and you come to him and you say, but there's, there's nothing I could do. There's no way that I could ever live up to this law that you gave in the first place. It is your righteous standard. It's different than my righteous standard. That's why the world has their own standard of what they think is right and wrong. But God's standard is perfect and holy and just. And there's no way we could ever measure up to it. And so when we look at it, when they, I mean, when they tried to follow this law, they should have seen like, there's no way I could have done it all the sacrifices that would have had to happen. I mean, all the blood that would have been everywhere. Like they would have been surrounded by it. Like I just made this mistake. I got to go kill this animal. Like, and you're looking at it like every time, like it was all there as a road sign to point to Christ. And so they didn't see it. 
And, um, and I think it's interesting, that's why he starts speaking in parables here, like the way that he did. I mean, this is starts his kingdom parables. He was coming to do something different. Like he was coming to build his church. He was looking for somebody that had a heart conditioned, like somebody that was going to approach him humble and say, there's nothing I can do to earn your favor. I will, um, you've extended mercy to me, taken something away from me that um, you've withheld the punishment that I deserve and you've given me a gift that I don't deserve, your grace. Um, and I just accept it as a gift. But a lot of the world, they can't, they can't accept that. Nobody likes to accept a gift. They feel like they got to do something in return. It's pretty free. Um, I mean, it's like a political melting pot, and it's um, like on the Israeli side, you can you pretty much have free will to do what you will. Like I could go there and open preach, no problem, uh, if I wanted to. There are people doing it in various spots. Um, you could do it even on the Palestinian side too, if you wanted to. But I think over on that side, um, you might end up, you might just disappear. So um, there is a level of like. It, there is a level of, uh, like, you have to walk with caution everywhere you're at because there's just a melting pot of culture. Um, whether you're, like, on the Temple Mount, like, if you open up a Bible while you're on the Temple Mount during Shabbat, they'll come over and they're, like, <laughs> screaming at you, like, what are you doing? Like, they don't like that, so they find that disrespectful. Um, so, um, but there is not laws against it. The, like, the Temple Mount itself, like, the Israelites aren't allowed to go up there because that's, um, that's Palestinian. Uh, so Israel, Israel, Israelites aren't allowed to go up there. And then there are certain, certain areas that Israelites are not allowed to go either. Oh, Israelites don't go into the West Bank. It's, Palest, it's, it's Muslim Israelites that are allowed to go in and out of the West Bank. So you have Israelites that are Muslim. Like, so our taxi driver, he was Muslim, but an Israelite. Three generations ago, they were, uh, they were Christian and they converted to Muslim, which was very interesting. We had dinner in their house. Um, they invited us over for dinner, and um, so we got some cool conversations with him. But he can go freely wherever he wants, but the Israeli citizens that are Jewish, are not, they do not go into the West Bank. So it's, it's complicated. It's, I don't, it's, it's very strange. Yeah, it was predominantly Muslim. I mean, it was trampled underfoot for 2,000 years after they were, uh, after uh, is, uh, Jerusalem was sacked in 70 AD and they were scattered across the planet. Um, I mean, they, uh, the nation was predominantly Muslim. So it was uh, his great-grandfather that, um, that converted over. And then what they do is they pass it down as like a law. Like, it, it's just, this is, that was the rule that they were this is the rule, yeah. And he was more of a cultural Muslim. He wasn't like a, he wasn't a, a devout, um, like he wasn't a devout Muslim. He didn't stop and pray and and, um, and turn to Mecca and pray. He didn't. Uh, he didn't do anything like that. Um, his wife was more, I would say, traditional, like in the sense of uh, her faith was a lot more serious than his was. Um, and it's the same thing as the Jew with the Jews too. You have the Orthodox Jews that are really intense into like um, following. Uh, following the law and trying to abide by it the best they can and the tr traditions that come with it. Then you have your cultural Jews um, that are just, um, I don't know, they, they celebrate Shabbat, but they don't do anything else outside of that. And, um, and then you have the Christians there that, are, that, uh, that visit the place that are from all over, the, all over the world. And that is a melting pot. And they don't get along with each other. Well, Orthodox are very prominent. You'll see, like, um, they have their tassels. They'll have, like, the hair, like, the, the curls coming down. Uh, they're dressed in um, mostly black garments. They'll have the hats. And um, then you'll see, like, cultural Jews. I don't mean the profile, but you can definitely point them out. They're dressed very fancy. Um, they just, they look like they're just, I, I would say, very... Uh, I wouldn't even call it festive. I just would say, I mean, they have yarmulkes on. Most of them have that. Um, and then the, the Muslims, 
um, I don't know, they kind of stay out of the certain quarters. Like if you go into the Jew, like in the old city, it's split up into different quarters. And so they'll stay out of like the Christian quarter. You have like, like the old city is sectioned off into all these different quarters. So, um, but you can tell them apart as well. Yeah. Yeah, they, well, there's two reasons why they, they don't, they can't do the sacrifices. Uh, one, they don't have a third temple. Um, currently, there's, on the Temple Mount, uh, there is the Dome of the Rock, uh, where they believe um, this is, would be like the Muslims' third most holy site. This is where they believe Barak, or uh, Muhammad ascended on uh, his horse Barak to heaven. So you have the Dome of the Rock there. And that's why the Jews are always, uh, they're wailing at the Western Wall there because they believe that's the original wall of Solomon's, of the temple. And they can't build their temple uh, because there is the Dome of the Rock sitting up there. It's the most contested piece of real estate on the planet. And so um, if they were to, they could go knock the thing down and kick them off and go build the temple at any point. But the other reason um, for the temple as well and the, the sacrifices in Numbers 19, they need a spotless red heifer, the ashes from a spotless red heifer in order to um, purify the, the priest to resume Levitical sacrifices. Um, and they don't have the spotless, well, they think they have it right now, actually. There's five of them arrived in Israel last fall, but they have, I think they have to go three years or something according to their tradition um, I mean, in Numbers 19, it gives the specifications um, of what that need, what qualifies them, the burnt ashes, uh, but they've added additional tradition and, um, and rules into that. Um, Right, they, and we know that, but there will be a third temple according to prophecy that will be built for the end times. They will rebuild it. It just won't be, um, God won't be in there because we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So um, the veil was torn and we were, at, we were granted access to God and, um, and now he lives in us. We are now the Holy of Holies, those who have proclaimed Jesus as Lord, but they don't recognize that, um, but they will. Seventy AD, yeah. No, um, no, they weren't. Um, there's so I mean, and they hadn't been in their land until 1948. 1948, they were um, they became a nation, um, and then they have been they've been coming from all over the world back home, and the nation has been being built up, uh, but they cannot resume those things until the temple is rebuilt, and then they have the ashes from the, the red heifer. I think there are Samaritans that still do. There are still Samaritans that exist, and I've heard that they do sacri sacrifices, um, which is, um, I saw pictures of that a, a while back. I have, Emery will have to give you, I'll have to send it to Emery. Yeah. This but. might sound dumb, but what's a spotless red heifer? It's a cow. That's what I thought. It's a red cow. Yeah. What they would do is they, like, they had, they had what was called the Pua Shalom yeah. there, and they've identified that in Jerusalem, uh, um, in the city of David. And so you have, um, like, the Gion Spring. It is a, um, a spring of water, and, in, and it's, it's ever flowing, but it would flow into this, this Pua Shalom, and people would wash and purify themselves in this pool before they could actually go into the temple. Yeah. And so... They're currently excavating the whole thing right now. They just started it a month ago. 
um, like the entire thing, and their plan is is to open it because they think that they have these red heifers. Um, so they would mix the ashes in with the, the water, and people could purify in the water. So. Don't they have coals and McDonald's and stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the menu looks different. Get some hummus on your burger. <laughs> Yeah, it's very advanced. It is not like, it's not a primitive place. Um, Israel is very, um, um, they're, one of their biggest exports is tech. They're like a Silicon Valley. Um, well, tech and diamonds are their two biggest exports. Um, they're, it is a thriving metropolis. The, the place is completely like thriving with agriculture. Um, they're, they're exporting food. I mean, they have, the place is, it, it's, it's wild. It's not what you expect. Yeah, they're very they're very split right now, from what I understand. And you can see you can see the tension of that when you're over there. Like you can start like it wasn't as bad. I hear it's really bad right now, um, over the last few weeks. Um, but it's basically it's like a. You ever feel like there's just like an electricity in the air, like you can just like cut tension with a knife? That's what the place feels like there, like everywhere you're at, and it, and depending on where you're at, it's it's higher, and like it could just like. It's like a, a tinderbox, like it could just explode at any any moment, and you just wonder like, how is this all working? Like, uh, I just wanted to add, uh, my daughter-in-law's family is originally from Jordan, and she has a cousin who is a Catholic priest in West Bank, Palestine. Okay. Yeah. As I understand it from, from them. The, 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 the Christian church. The Christian church, the Catholic church that is in the West Bank is tolerated as long as they are anti Israel. So my daughter, uh, my daughter in law's father is very anti Israel. But that's tolerated in, in that church. It's interesting. It is interesting that you say that because, like, our taxi driver, I asked him. I'm like, how is it that I'm able to walk, come into the West Bank and I'm fine? He goes, well, we don't have a problem with you. He goes, we just don't like the Jews. And, um, and the crazy thing about it is, like, they were supposed to kick all those people out. Like, God instructed them back in the Old Testament to go, I mean, go clear them out. This is the land that I have promised you. And so, like, it's still a thorn in their side to this day. But the thing that's interesting and that was kind of, like, paradoxical for me as a, as a follower is you got followers in there that still get it. Like I met, I met a gentleman that was fine with this being Israel. He didn't like it, but he understood scripturally that like, we're technically like not even supposed to be in this land. This was, this land was given to the, to the Israelites in the first place. Um, so it was just, it's interesting because what, what's our mission, right? Our mission is to share Jesus Christ no matter where we're at. And so, um, I think like somebody like that that doesn't like it, like how are they sharing that mission? Because that's their, th that's who they've been entrusted. God has entrusted them to go proclaim truth to. So they're, yes, they're in there, but how are they proclaiming truth, right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I don't feel as bad. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but uh, I did want to mention a couple of weeks ago there was in the Israeli Senate, and to the gentleman in the back that made the comment about them being screwed up, like us, um, there was a law, there was a proposal introduced in the Israeli Senate, Senate a couple of weeks ago to outlaw Christian evangelism. In Israel. Oh. I don't think it'll go anywhere. <laughs> it'll probably fail. But it hasn't the first time that it's been proposed. So once in a while that does come up again, but right now it's still in the Senate. So. Yeah. 
I mean, I don't know how effective I, I would have been myself in proclaiming truth there because I don't know much about them. Like after speaking with that one guy in Nazareth, uh, he knows everything about uh, the Muslims. He knows everything about the Jews. And, and then he learns all the different um, like denominations of Christianity. And so he said, he go, I asked him what it was like sharing truth here. And he said, it is very difficult because you have to know everything about everybody in order to be able to meet them where they're at to be able to take the gospel to them. Um, so um, it's not to say that I can't go proclaim God's word, but um, like I mean, I was able to share the gospel with, with the Muslim taxi driver, which was, which was, awesome, which was awesome. But um, I think somebody that's in the trenches there, um, just like here, like I'm gonna be able to go, be able to share truth with somebody in my backyard much stronger than I would be able to um, in that environment, just because this is my this is where I'm from, I can relate to these people more. Um, if that makes sense. I didn't get. I looked up what you were asking about. It's Hasidic truth. Yes. It says they believe that prayer and acts of loving kindness are a means of reaching God. Mm -hmm. So the Orthodox. Um, um, it's just another. I think your strongest, like the strongest people over there, that the strongest evangelists are Jews that have converted, Messianic Jews. Um, they know the Old Testament in and out, and when they, when Jesus has opened their heart, like they can see him through all of it, and so they're on fire for the Lord over there. And so you have a lot of them in the trenches there that are um, that have churches, and they just know how to reach the reach their people better than um, we would be able to. But um, that's not to say that it negates us from being able to do it. In the Bible, uh, when Jesus was coming into uh, Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and they were, you know, praising him with palm trees and everything, well, he had a coat with him that was saddled. In some of my Bibles, I read that, and I wondered, I looked it up, I wondered what did that coat, rideless coat mean with, with him? And and the Bible told me that it meant that the Israelites or the Jews did not accept Jesus. Right. So they had, and I had never read that in some of my Bibles. And it, was, it just bugged me that I couldn't figure out why he was carrying, he had a saddle coat with him when he rode into the Jerusalem. Yeah. Have also you ever read that? Huh? What's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but he had, he rode in, but yeah, but he had the coat with him that had no rider, and it was saddled also. Yeah. And, the, of course, the coat of the, the one he was riding on, the motor. And I thought, what does, you know, because I had never read that, and I kept looking up different my Bibles, and it said that it represented, he represented, the Jews were not accepting him, that that, that was empty. He grafted the Gentiles in. I mean, do you think back to like Ishmael when he said, I'll make you a wild donkey of a, a man, right? I, there's, and this is not, this is just, it's just, there's probably no connect, there could be no connection here, but it's interesting that he rode in on a tame donkey, yeah. like the Gentile nation. So the Jews rejected him and then, yeah, and then, and then no, no, no rider. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe said with the colt, but it never said, it says a rideless colt with it. And mm -hmm. it's a saddle. So I thought, wow. You know, yeah. And I found in one of my, my study Bibles, it says because for that reason, the Jews did not accept him as Christ. So I thought, oh. Yeah, that's I gotta tell that. I gotta tell him. That's I'm great. All right, I'm three minutes over, so what, I'm going to, can I pray for all of you, and then, um, and then we can stay after and talk, and I'll be, I can answer any more questions. No, I'm going to pray. <laughs> yep, we stopped in verse 20, yes, 24. We stopped in verse 23, so...
The next one is parable of the weeds. Okay, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much um, again for your word, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, um, for just uh, the charge that you've given us to go and take your, your message forward, uh, to go sow seeds all over the place, um, whether that's in our family or out in, 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 in town or anybody that we encounter, or all the people that you've placed before us in our life, where we can take comfort in knowing that it was uh, that we're just out planting and watering, but it's you that gives the increase. Um, and Lord, we can also take comfort in the fact that your word doesn't return back void. Um, you set to purpose every word that's sent out. And so God, I pray that you would give us just uh, um, give us a boldness to be able to proclaim truth, even when we feel our hearts start to race. And um, and Lord, I just pray that we would just uh, we would we would just be sensitive to your Holy Spirit to see uh, people around us that and the opportunities that you've presented us with to be able to share this this good news. Um, God, we pray that um, you would just be with anybody in here that is uh, struggling. Uh, I pray that you would uh, just uh, give their body healing. I pray you would just be with them, give them encouragement. Um, God, I pray for uh, just the weekend ahead as uh, the message is going to go forward on Sunday that it would be used in a mighty way. Uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.